Today is February 8th, 2012. I'm Chris Babel. Today we're talking with Larry Sass, Associate Professor of Architecture at MIT. Professor Sass conducts research in the area of rapid prototyping and its relationship to building construction. His current research projects are focused on design fabrication, using computer modeling and proto prototyping as representational tools in the design process in place of traditional paper drawings. Before coming to MIT, Professor Sass worked professionally as a project architect. His work has been exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art and also has been featured in many other exhibitions around the country. He holds a PhD and master's degree in architecture from MIT and a bachelor's degree from the Pratt Institute. Uh, Professor Sass, thanks very much for coming in today to talk to us. Oh yeah, this is an honor to do this. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> really looking forward to it. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about your path to MIT. Uh, you grew up in New York. Tell me about growing up. Yeah, so I, uh, I grew up, in, uh, up in, in Harlem, but it's technically Washington Heights. Uh, Harlem was right down the hill from uh, Washington Heights. And I, and I, uh, I had two parents. I lived in a two-parent household. My mother was a um, uh, sort of a secretary in a high school, uh, actually the same high school that uh, Manny Ramirez, the baseball player, went to. And uh, she knew him when he, she, he was there. And uh, my father was a clerk in the mail room, uh, in the mail room of a um, ad, ad agency in downtown Manhattan. And I went to uh, local high schools, uh, but I was uh, local high schools up until about third grade, but I was part of the busing program in New York, which I know they also had here in Boston. And um, went to a really nice high school, high school of music and art, uh, which is different than uh, the high school of performing arts, which is the fame high school. High school. And um, and then after that, I went to, I actually didn't go straight into college. I went to a small technical school for about uh, two years called Institute of Design and Construction. And I learned drafting and, and, uh, and, and, and a lot of uh, sort of the fundamentals of construction. And, and that was really because I couldn't get into college. I really had a really horrible high school um, life. And, uh, you know, I, I needed some time to catch up. And then after that, I uh, went to Pratt and um, just had a great time at Pratt and applied to MIT. So, so how did you get interested in design? Was it something that was kind of always part of your life, even when you were a little kid, or? Oh, no, it, yeah. definitely not. I, but see, I'm one of these people, who, I've wanted to be an architect since I was 12, and I wanted to uh, practice in the industry of architecture since I was 12. And I, and I got into it through an uncle, my uncle Lawrence, who I'm named after, and he, uh, he really, taught me about design and he was a graphic artist for Shears and Lehman Brothers and he explained to me how design worked I mean you know what most people never really talk about design and he could actually have a really good conversation about it and he always had architectural magazines around his home and I just love going to his house he always had beautiful things well designed things so he got me into architecture when I was about 12 he bought me a t-square and a triangle one of those plastic triangles that you buy in a store. So that was my introduction to architecture. So for you, it was always design and architecture. I mean, you, you, you sort of, I mean, I'm thinking back to when I was 12, I don't think I knew what an architect was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, the Brady Bunch was on at the time. Yeah. So I really had a chance to see, and there was one episode where they, and it was, actually I realized there was, only, there was only one episode where they actually showed uh, Michael Brady from above, where they showed, uh, his the layout of his desk, uh, the the compass, the triangles, and uh, I think his electric eraser. And then I said, "Wow, that's an architect. That's what you know how people design buildings." And I I, I really saw that as being very exciting. So I have a, a friend who's raising kids in New York, and he's got a son who may be a future architect. who's just obsessed with. The, the buildings of the city, mm -hmm. bridges, the, I mean, were you like that? Did oh, you, yeah. Did you find, your, you find yourself going around the city? And oh, yeah. It's New York City, if you like buildings, you will love buildings being in New York City. God. Growing up in New York, I rode my bike around the city. After a while, I felt like I knew every single building in the city. I knew all of the details in the buildings, and I was really fascinated by the intricacy of moldings and, um, how uh, the moldings of old, the older buildings determined scale, and the newer buildings that didn't have moldings, they still, 
they still had scale to them, but they, they were just really different. And But every single building was fascinating to me as a child. I, I just, I was amazed to uh, watching a building go go up. Were there, were there styles that spoke to you at that point, or was it just kind of omnivorous? No, you know? I really, I think when I was a child, uh, up until high school, I didn't really know what style was and what the variations between the styles were, and didn't really understand the difference between a modernist style and, uh, I don't know, a neoclassical style or uh, sort of the Beaux-Arts styles of New York City. I, I really didn't know the differences. So when you went to Pratt, you went there with the intention of studying architecture seriously. I mean, that was kind of your... Yeah. So when I was started at Pratt, I was 21. I, um, I had also worked at a French restaurant for about three years prior, and I'd worked, you know, starting as a dishwasher in high school and worked my way uh, up to um, cutting vegetables and working at the stove on a few occasions. Uh, but by the time I started Pratt, I had left all of that behind, and I was really, really engaged in architecture. I, I, I um, at that point, I felt like I really, really knew that I wanted to be involved in architecture, and so I uh, took a lot of studios. I, uh, with every professor I could probably try to get, whose class I could get into, and and I just absolutely fell in love with drawing, making models. Uh, uh, learning art, its relationship to architecture, because that was a really big thing back in the 80s, was identifying um, artists who had some influence over the industry of architecture, um, and seeing the correlations between the two fields growing. So let me just follow up with that. Give me an example of what, what you mean by artists influencing architecture or... Yeah, so uh, a good example, I think, might be um, Donald Judd who uh, created these beautiful modernist boxes and um, modernist sculptures uh, out of plastic and metal, and seeing other architects who were trying to make these pure uh, modernist buildings with pure modernist details. Um, I, if I could think of an architect that was close, maybe of the time, um, maybe Gwathmi Siegel or uh, Richard Meyer and how they made these really gorgeous modernist boxes or modernist expressions with different forms uh, that were very similar to work like of people like Donald Judd or um, yeah I, I'm really that's a really tough one because I think even at the time people struggled to try and figure out what the relationship was but in New York City the the architecture scene always had a relationship with the museum scene so whatever was going on as far as paintings and uh, maybe a new painter that would come out. Um, the architecture world at least had s some sort of um, discussion around them. There was there was always a little bit of a back and forth. So, thinking back to the time you were at Pratt, when you were really starting to kind of you know get serious about pre-professional training to be an architect, what were your what were your ambitions? I mean, what kinds of buildings were you thinking about designing? What kind of career oh, wow, trajectory yeah. were you thinking about? I think at that time I wanted to be like every other architect. I really admired um, uh, Richard Rogers and Norman Foster and uh, I, I hated Frank Gehry at the time. I, I, I remember in class they would show his work and I just couldn't understand it. I thought it was just god-awful. And um, I, I, I really wanted to be a practicing, a sole practitioner. I wanted to do my own work. I wasn't interested in working for other architects, but I knew that you needed to do that in order to get licensed and move on to uh, uh, your own practice. But I wanted to be like everyone else um, and do my own work. So, so of the choices you, you had or that you could have made, what, what made you think about MIT as a as a, a place to go oh, on? Oh, you know, and I, I must say I hadn't, MIT, I didn't even Actually, I hadn't heard of MIT until I was 21 years of age. <laughs> I, I heard about it for the first time when uh, these two friends of mine, uh, these two sisters, one of them got into Stanford, and then a year later another one got into, no, I'm sorry, one of them got into MIT, and then a year later one of them got into Stanford. And I had heard about MIT for the first time at her house, and I asked somebody what it was, and they said, oh, that's a really big technical school in Massachusetts. So by the time that I uh, had graduated from uh, my undergraduate from Pratt, I, I knew I needed to go back to graduate school, but I, I wasn't, it wasn't on my mind. 
I had worked for about six months for a small architectural firm, and then I got laid off in, uh, I think it was 1990, um, the, the late summer of 1990, but that was during the first Bush years. And that was a real turning point for me, and that was because I, I just couldn't find a job. I, I took my resume around to every architectural firm I could think, about, think of at the time, and I just struggled to find work. And by the time the wintertime rolled around, my unemployment insurance had started running out. And uh, I had very quickly, you know, just ran out of money and started on public assistance for a little while. And that was, that was really painful because my parents were on public assistance when I was a child. And to go back to that and, and sort of relive, um, uh, still living in, in, in Harlem and still living in the same building that I grew up in, uh, was just, you know, a really painful time. So then I started looking very hard at either at one of two options, either going to graduate school or um, working really, really trying hard to get a job in an office somewhere in New York. And um, I took a trip up to Massachusetts with uh, a girlfriend at the time, and we looked at Harvard and Yale. Uh, we, on the way up, we looked at Yale, and, uh, and then I arrived at MIT. And I said, wow, this is just a great place. I had met so many um, just very basic down-to-earth people who uh, were really interested in the social aspects of architecture. And that's what really drew me to apply to MIT. But the first time I applied, I, I actually uh, I applied to a number of places. And I withdrew my application. I, I actually didn't send a lot of them in because I knew my work wasn't ready. And then I waited a year later, and that was really good. And then I managed to get accepted into the program. So I'm really interested in this idea of you know, the, the social aspect of architecture, um, which is obviously a thread that I see that runs th has run through your work. Yeah. Um, is that something that from the beginning was there in your mind? I mean, when you were at Pratt, when you yeah. were training, you know, just describe what you mean by that and the kinds of issues that you were dealing with or wrestling with. Yeah, I think I think when I was at Pratt, I was uh, I think I was more concerned with the artistic side of the industry. I was really into the visual aspects of the industry, the you know doing things that were poetic. By the time I came to MIT, I had I really said to myself, architects should have a greater influence over uh, over the environment, over the architectural environment for people who were uh, struggling, and that architects were people who could make that environment beautiful. Little did I know that so much of the environment and design environment of uh, poor neighborhoods really had a lot to do with politics. I assume that the architect had a lot more power than they really do. Um, so when I applied to the school, I still really believe in all of the values dur that I had uh, during my application, you know, the idea of um, taking really rough streets and turning them into really beautiful works of architecture, uh, socially organizing um, cities to match the culture, um, not imposing a, sort of a, a, a broad view of architecture onto one culture, um, really looking at the culture very carefully in the planning process. So those really stuck with me. Um, from the, I'd say, the end of my time at Pratt to the beginning of my time at, at MIT. Yeah, one thing I'm curious about is, and, you know, not to sort of sidetrack, but the relationship between architecture and urban planning and, you know, right. sort of the role, you sort of referenced the role of the architect in these political processes. And I'm wondering if, you know, what your thoughts are on, on that. Yeah, um, I was fortunate enough to take a couple of urban planning classes during my early years at, at MIT. And urban planning, I realized over time, is a, it, there are two parts. There's the physical design of the environment, uh, how build, heights of buildings, uh, volumes, uh, setbacks. And then there are the social policies that go with uh, cities and states um, or countries. Uh, those are usually determined by politicians or planners, and they really are different. And I, and I, the role of an architect, an architect can influence both of those, but I think architects tend to fall more into the physical planning and uh, programming, the organization of how the um, environment might 
you know, move, how people move through the city. But I, it took me a while to realize they are separate things. And um, over time, I realized my interests were not as broad and as big as that. Although now they're starting to return to that. So when you were <clears throat> thinking about graduate schools, visiting schools, and you, you, know, you said you sort of really felt you connected at MIT, did, was there a sense at that point that there were more people at MIT or that MIT was more interested, more preoccupied with these social aspects of architecture yeah. than at other, other places? Yeah, very much so. I, I still felt, I felt that Harvard University was more like my undergraduate where there was a real connection to the, the arts and the visual aspects of architecture um, and not so much the social. Uh, I mean, of course, there are, there are professors there that were very concerned with both, but um, I, I felt that the dominant was the visual. And at MIT, I felt that planning and architecture were, the two, the two departments were one. And at that time, back in the 90s, planning and architecture hadn't made a, a really big separation. We both shared the same computer lab, so planning students worked alongside of architecture students. And uh, planning was a big part of, or at least talking about the urban scale, was a big part of architecture in general. A good example of that is the is government center here in Boston and how um, the architects that were part of that really thought of how the building would be laid out in the environment. It wasn't just a single building on a single block. It was part of a larger scheme and a larger way of thinking about the city. And that was preceded, I think, when I was here, preceded, uh, I was sort of, uh, not preceded, but I was right after people like Ke uh, Kevin Lynch and um, I'm trying to think of a couple other urbanists who were in architecture. Uh, who are, uh, some of the names escaped my mind, but there were a number of people who sort of crossed between architecture and, pl and, and planning. So what, what were your initial impressions of MIT when you, when you arrived? I mean, was it, the, uh, the was it, did you settle in or? I mean. Yeah, you know, I, I have to say, I, 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 it wasn't that visually impressive. I mean, the place was, you know, it was kind of dirty, you know, and that, uh, the, 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 the floor where architecture was was sort of like the basement. There were very few windows. It was a, it was a pretty dismal place, I must say. It, was, it, it visually was not attractive. Um, but, but I wasn't really interested in that. I was really interested in the community. And I think I had, when I applied, I really didn't know how big MIT really was, particularly for architecture. Because in my undergraduate, most people talked about Columbia University or um, Harvard and Yale. Those were the real big architecture schools. So MIT was not on the map of architecture. To me, it was sort of a, um, still like a technical trade school almost. But once I arrived and I managed to get to know the professors and the students, I realized the place was absolutely incredible. It, it, uh, some of the great professors that were here at the time, Jack Meyer, who designed the Boston Architectural Center, and Jan, Jan Wampler, who was a real big thinker of uh, uh, urbanism as well as architecture. I, I was just really, really impressed by the way that they thought about architecture and the way that they engaged students in learning and thinking about design. It was really different than my undergraduate. So I wanted to ask you about something that I, I think was very formative uh, in your career, which was your uh, introduction to computer-aided design uh, at MIT. Can you just talk about kind of where you were at coming in yeah. and how that happened? Whew. Yeah, that's a pretty weird story. Um, <clears throat> when I was at Pratt, I, I, I think I took one computer aided class from this guy, Hans Leszewski, and he was an MIT graduate, but I didn't know that at the time. And he said, uh, in the 1990s, if you want to get a job in architecture, you'll have to learn computers. You'll have to know how to draft on a computer, and you'll have to know how to make a three-dimensional model. And so I think by the time I got to MIT, I, I sort of took him seriously. I had no idea of how to use a computer. I barely knew how to turn one on. And my first class was an introductory design, an introductory computer class with uh, Professor Earl Mark, um, who was a student of Bill Mitchell's. And um, that class just terrified me. I was really afraid of computers. I hated computers, actually. I loved drawing. I was still from the school of drawing and um, painting. Um, and, and I, I, I really just had very little interest, but I knew I needed to take one to get a job. 
So my first class, uh, I learned how to three-dimensionally model a Palladian building. And I, um, and it's really interesting because actually I lost the file. I, 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 I logged out at the time and I didn't know that when you log out it doesn't save your, your work. <laughs> and so I, I lost all of my work and I have no, I have nothing from that time. But the, the thing that excited me the most I think about computers was uh, meeting Bill Mitchell. That, that really um, was amazing because I could see, uh, he, he, he kind of, sort of introduced me through lectures. He gave lectures, one or two lectures in the class. And then I think uh, I, was, I, was, I was quite, you know, turned on by the idea that you could make a three-dimensional model of a building and you could print it out in many different views. But I still wasn't like completely, you know, thrilled by it. I, I still kind of had reservations and still liked to draw. So, how did that then progress? I mean, I, turn into I, a, a, a career. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, well, it was sort of a little bit by accident. I had um, met a really great man, I, Ike Colbert, um, right when I came in, and I, I met him because I felt like it was the right thing to do. A number of people had talked about him and said, "You really need to meet Ike." And Ike was in touch with the arts community in Boston, and he knew an architect, Donald Stull who had designed a monument uh, to memorialize the slave trade. And uh, he wanted to uh, build this in the Boston Harbor on one of the islands. And at the time, Ike was insightful enough to know that, oh, we could make a computer animation of this monument and use the computer animation as a marketing tool to raise money. So I met, I met, uh, met up with Ike the winter that I was here, January uh, 93, and um, Ike introduced me to a graduate, to an undergraduate student, Craig Anderson, um, who uh, at the time was in, uh, I think it was a computer science major, and he was also taking architecture classes. So the two of us sat down and we met. We we we, we met the architects. We met the artists who was all, who were also involved with this, and the project was, and it was funded by Ike. The project. And um, Bill Mitchell was the uh, um, was the supervisor. He was his. It was his role was to help us figure out how to make this computer animation of this monument. So we all had a meeting in that same January, and then uh, afterwards, Greg and I really learned how to computer model, and we both really learned how to render. And then by the summertime, we learned how to to animate and. In 92, 93, that was really new. There were only a handful of people that really knew how to make computer animations, and they didn't have uh, computers that were fast enough to do a lot of really high-powered rendering. So we really had a big challenge on our hands because Ike said, I, I, you know, I love his voice, how he says, I want this video, and you know, I really want to see this done by, I think it was September. And frankly, Greg and I really didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> And so Bill, you know, he gave us a few inspirational talks and he kind of talked about some of the things that we could do. And he, Bill had already had students who had animated buildings and he had an idea of how some of the animation should work. But I still think that at the time Bill didn't quite know how to make, turn it into a movie or turn it into a production that could be used for marketing. So for Greg and I, what we did was we looked at movies and we looked at... Uh, 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 the animation in general, how people made animation, animated movies, uh, but hand animated movies, not computer animated movies. And then um, that summer, the two of us really worked very hard and we rendered and rendered and rendered images and put them together in, a in one of the production studios in Building 9. And by that September, the two of us had a really nice animation, computer animation of this um, monument. And the architect saw it for the first time in the fall. And it was really great seeing the reaction on his face, seeing how happy he was uh, to see his work in motion. And at the time, all he had was a wood model and uh, two small drawings, or three small drawings of it. It's amazing how uh, 
<coughs> quickly that then became something that people took for granted. I mean, yeah, the, right. The yeah. Oh, no one had seen a computer animation, and no one had seen an animation like that. What we did was we combined still images with moving images. We did a lot of editing work, uh, uh, stuff that now people could do in a couple of hours on a computer. It took us weeks to do. We. The big thing that we, uh, big problem that we had was rendering time. So to make a rendering, you need 24 frames to make one second of animation, and we knew we needed minutes of animation. So uh, this was before MIT really had lockdown policies on computers. Um, at that time, you could, you could, you could sit at a terminal and log into a terminal in another building, and someone could be sitting at that terminal doing email, and you could read their email while they were writing it. <laughs> Stuff you would never think of today. So what we did was we rendered images in the background while people were writing email. And people didn't know, but they knew that their computer was going a little slower than they would normally think it would. But we used just about every computer we could get our hands on around the, around the institute to render images. And um, that was that turned out to be absolutely amazing. We really understood what the idea of rendering farms and a high-powered rendering was about. And more importantly, once we put everything together, we could see that people could understand a really complex uh, space. They could understand how it works. They understood how the lighting worked. They understood uh, the, the the monument in context because we put it uh, on an island. Uh, it was supposed to simulate an island out in the harbor. And that just completely got me. I, I knew at that time that I was really interested in computers. I knew that I wasn't that interest, interest, interested in the uh, uh, sort of the practicing aspects of architecture. I knew that I wanted to stay and um, do more. And I also knew that I really liked Bill Mitchell at the time. Uh, and and I was just totally, I was totally sold. So tell me about working with with Bill. I mean, what was so special about working with him? Yeah. What kind of it's stories do you have? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of stories about Bill. <laughs> um, but more importantly, I think at the time um, when I met Bill, I, I, it's really wild. I find that at, I think at the time I didn't really know how much he really knew. I, I knew he was a really good writer. I knew that he was good at talking about aspects of computing and architecture, but I really didn't quite know how insightful he was. I, I was not as interested in the research aspects of his work as I was more in where he was, which is he, he wanted to talk about architecture uh, or talk about computing in ways that related to, the, to ordinary people. So that's when he wrote books like um, Etopia and City of Bits. Uh, so he, he had more of a a relationship with uh, the, the public of architecture, the public aspects of architecture. So um, working with Bill, I think by the time that I got caught, uh, caught, in, caught up in working on projects with Bill, um, I knew a lot about how to render, I knew a lot about how to model, but I really didn't know that much about design and computation. And uh, what Bill was a Bill was a master of surrounding himself with brilliant people, so I had a chance to get to meet people like George Steiny and um, Terry Knight and uh, Frank Gehry um, and and Jim Glimpf and just a host of really brilliant people who um, knew a lot about computers, knew a lot about how to use them in practice, and knew a lot about how they worked and didn't work. And I think it was more the people that I, I were surrounded by Bill that caught my attention much more so than Bill himself. So I really got to know Bill the most when I took his class. And the first time I think I really took a class with him, I had known Bill for about four years before I really, really took a class with him. And then I really got to see uh, how he influenced students and also how students uh, who just didn't have the um, stomach to work with somebody like Bill, you know, sort of left. <laughs> Bill was a type of professor who, if you didn't have your own agenda, you just, it wasn't a good fit for you. Bill was not going to 
sit with you and teach you specific things. He more inspired and gave you direction. And that worked really well for somebody like myself. So what was, you, you know, you've mentioned this, but just sort of explicitly, what was your agenda at that point? Was it, I mean... So I, it's funny because I really didn't have an agenda. That's, that's, the irony was by the time I got into the PhD program with Bill, I, I, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do with my career. I was sort of at that middle point. And um, sometimes kind of wondering, wow, I'm surprised that he actually stuck with me. Um, at the time, I, I was really interested in uh, just learning more about computers. But what really turned, what the, the big turning point for me was when I took this class with him on Palladio. And Bill loved Palladio, the, the real first architect um, of its he was, Palladio, some people consider Palladio to be the, the, the architect. Like, no one else has built as much as Palladio. Uh, relative to the time, no one else had had as much of an influence. I still believe this. People, no one has had an, an influence on architecture the way that Palladio had. So Bill's thing was uh, Palladio computation and design, and uh, trying to understand how all of them work together. And so he surrounded himself uh, also with a great historian, uh, Howard Burns who was an amazing, um, he, he really understood Palladio better. He's to today, he's still the leading scholar uh, on Palladio. And so I had a chance to, uh, Bill gave me the chance to, to go to Vicenza. He, he, um, he, he helped me and encouraged me to go to Vicenza often to uh, model Palladian villas. And Bill at the time really wanted to figure out, I think, uh, I think he wanted to understand the relationship of how Palladio thought, how Palladio built his work, and sort of what Palladio really wanted to do, how he, Palladio wanted to make these ideal buildings. And I just got caught up in all of that. And the same thing goes with George Stein. He also wrote a lot about the topic. So I, I really got caught up in modeling Palladian villas, and particularly modeling and becoming obsessed with the ones that weren't built and trying to learn the relationship between Palladio's rules, uh, how uh, computation can deal with rules, and, uh, and at the time also a new thing, which was uh, rapid prototyping. So I managed to uh, 3D print one of the first little Palladian villas on this um, machine that Bill bought in about 98, and that, the, the uh, rapid prototyping was sort of the next level up from rendering, and then that was for me just another new opportunity and just a great, great moment was printing this little model for Bill. So you were actually taking buildings that had never been built, <coughs> creating 3D from models, and then actually printing the model, mm -hmm. so, so, just so I understand. That's right. So the, the, the point was, so Palladio drew, I think it was, if I can remember correctly, 23 uh, villas in one of his books. He was the first person to uh, produce uh, a collection of his work as printed drawings back in 1580. And some of those drawings were buildings that had never been built. And my job when I was working with Bill was to model the ones that had never been built from the rules in the book. And uh, the way you verify whether it was a really good model, or the way I verified whether it was a good model, was to make a 3D print of it. But at the time, it was really called fused deposition modeling. I think if uh, some of the professors around here knew that I was mixing plastic printing with real 3D printing, which is uh, powder base, um, they would be pretty upset. But so, so I was using fused deposition modeling to um, make prints of the three-dimensional models to verify the designs. So what, do you, what is fused deposition modeling? So fused deposition modeling is um, it, it's plastic printing. It's sort of like a hot glue gun, and it prints out strings of plastic layer by layer. But the real field is called layered manufacturing. It's three-dimensional printing and fused deposition modeling are both layered manufacturing methods. You make models in layers over time. It's just fused deposition modeling deals with plastic and heat. 3D printing deals with powder. Right, and that's when we when people think talk about fabrication. Now they're talking about the powder. Right, basically. they're talking about powder, right. and um, 
And also, it was also invented here, too, by Ellie Sachs. <laughs> so that, just to be clear, um, the company Z Corp was uh, started by an MIT student and is an MIT startup. Um, but, you know, over time, I, I got to use three-dimensional printing to make models, but I uh, it started off with fused deposition modeling. Okay. Um, one other thing I wanted to, to ask about, um, the, the sort of the environment, being a grad student at MIT, um, being an African American mm -hmm. coming here, uh, it's still true today, but even more so at that time. Uh, did you feel that you were isolated? Did you feel that you sort of stood out, stuck out? Uh, I've talked to others who have expressed yeah, that. Kind of yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, yeah, I definitely felt that when I first arrived in '92. There was a, the Black Graduate Student Union, and there were about 80 Black students, uh, graduate students, out of 5,000 at the time. And we really stuck together. We had events like the Ebony Affair, and where I met my wife, and um, uh, they had, um, you know, Ike was a real leader for that. And I, Ike, I have to say, Ike was the person who really held all of us together. He, everyone knew him. Everyone absolutely adored him, and he really knew how to inspire the black community to stick together as a group. I think Ike was one of the few people, few, particularly a few men that I know that are really all about, was all about community. So we had a really good community of black graduate students. But what was really important for me, uh, believe it or not, was um, uh, my graduate tutor job, my resident. I was a graduate, uh, I was a resident tutor in the dormitories in Newhouse. And I was the graduate tutor for Chocolate City for seven years. And Chocolate City is a uh, small group, living group, within the Newhouse dormitory of 20, if I can then always get the number, 28 undergraduate, mostly African-American students. Uh, it was always a mixture between, um, you know, students who were mixed, like you had students who were Korean and African-American or Caribbean, or you had students that were Indian that were not African-American. We had white students in the, in the dorm, uh, in the group. But that was really a big, source of community for me to be around these absolutely amazing young men who uh, at, in their own on their own time felt isolated but we all felt like we had a community once we were back in the dorm it was it was a spectacular place did you feel that that isolation uh, Lessened at all in the time you were here, or even since then? I mean, I, no. I, guess, I mean, I don't know if. Oh, without I mean, question, I know it's definitely huge, not. Yeah, yeah, it definitely has not. I mean, let's let's understand a couple of things. I was the first African American PhD student in my department, and I was also the first. I'm also the first African American professor uh, in in architecture in my department. But you know, for, you have to look at architecture as if it, if it, two parts: is MIT, and then there's the broader community of architecture. Architecture is not uh, an industry that draws a lot of African Americans. There are uh, less than uh, 2,000 African American architects in the country, licensed architects, and uh, that number has been about the same for two decades. So the industry doesn't really draw people. So that I knew when I was younger, and I never really looked to, you know, at the industry for community. What I have found at MIT over time was um, that MIT draws people who are just isolated in general. It's sort of like everybody feels isolated in some way. And so it, after a while, you kind of realize that your issues are the same for most people around the campus. Um, what makes them special and unique for African Americans is that we're Americans. We are uh, people who have been here for hundreds of years. And it does get a little daunting when you realize that how few Americans that are of African descent are make it to MIT, and particularly make it as faculty. There are very, very few faculty of color uh, on the campus, and that part gets pretty lonely over time. Well, certainly, uh, you know, not to jump ahead of the story, and there's no mm -hmm. we reason we have to be chronological, but, <laughs> but, um, yeah. but the issue of, of um, African-American faculty is obviously one that's just been really vexing. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that, 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 there, that it just has not really, uh, you know, the, 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 the ratio has not shifted much. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. surprisingly little. And I was wondering if you have thoughts on what's 
what you know what's gone wrong what, yeah. what's what's not being done what should be well i yeah that's a really tough thing to no, I it's yeah. a tough question because but it's a right it's the right question to ask and i think it's i think it's an important thing to talk about um, first i think it, yeah i think you can't ignore that it is difficult to find uh, people to work at a place like MIT um, who can sort of have the stomach to be at a place like MIT. And I'm, and I'm not saying that uh, there aren't a lot of people out there. It's just hard to find them. Um, there aren't that many African Americans in the industry of architecture to begin with. And of those who are in the industry to find people who are really interested in teaching full time and making the commitment to move to a place like Massachusetts is, is not that that easy. So I can, I can understand why there hasn't been a, a lot, but that number is growing. I mean, there are really good architects out there, African American architects, who are uh, at least applying to positions here, and um, I am starting to see some change. But I do think that now the the movement is kind of gone. I think that the momentum is gone, and I think that people see it as uh, administrators is not as, as an important issue. But I think that it, at some point it will come back to being an important issue because it really is the, the African Americans I do think symbolize civil rights to begin with and I, in this country and I do think that they symbolize uh, growth and change. And without that, without at least the something at a, at a core level, you're, you're really missing out on, um, you're missing out on the spirit of the United States. And, and I think that that always has to be there, at least in a place like this. So for example, here's a, a good example, I think, uh, seeing students trying to come to MIT from the Middle East and seeing the difficulties that um, students have had over the years and then also when students arrive, seeing how students from these countries, in their own countries, are fighting for their own civil rights. And, I, and I, I'm more than certain that most of them see me and say, oh, here's a person who probably can identify with fighting for civil rights in a country against a majority group. And it's kind of, it's kind of interesting now. Um, uh, I, I think of an Egyptian student that works with me, and I think of a student I met the other day who was Palestinian, and I realize I completely identify with both of them. And I think it's really, if that wasn't there in the department, I think the department would be losing out. And it's an institute-wide question or issue, right? I mean, it's, not, it's, really yeah. not, it's really not confined to architecture. It's Not at all. Yeah. And there are some departments who have never broken the color barrier, like I think mathematics might be one of them. Um, there, there are a number of places around the Institute who have also done very well with uh, recruiting and uh, including African Americans in their programs, like Aero Astro. Um, but it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. I, 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 never, I, I, n I never feel that uh, people don't welcome the opportunity to make these things happen, but I just feel like it's such a big challenge that um, you need a very special person to make to, to to really reduce color barriers and to make people feel included. So, so let's sort of talk about your uh, joining of joining the faculty. I guess first mm -hmm. of all, at what point did you think about you know really seriously that? academia would be kind of a calling or a direction that you would want to go in. And yeah. You said you started out focused on the practice mm -hmm. of architecture. Mm -hmm. And actually right after I graduated with my PhD, yeah. I went right back into an exactly. architectural yeah. office here in Boston. Right. I worked at Shepley Bullfinch and I, 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 I thought that I would be there for five or six years and I really wanted to try my work, work my way up to becoming a principal and things like that and getting my license and uh, going through that part of my life. But I think I very quickly realized that my interests were in um, learning more about uh, uh, learning more about how to produce buildings than I was in designing them. Because I do feel like there are a number of people out there who are great designers. I don't think there are too many people out there that's, that are willing to say, um, let's figure out how to make this building cheaper. Let's figure out how to produce this. Uh, as a product at a lower cost than 
the way that people were producing buildings before. I do think that architects think about that all the time in practice, but I don't think that anybody has been thinking about that as a, uh, a system of production, a way of like revolutionizing or changing the way that we make things. So my interest very quickly changed when I, um, I think when I really got the call from Bill Mitchell, uh, who had said that there's an opening and an opportunity for you to work at MIT and uh, we would like for you to apply. And then once I was here, I think there was always a part of me that had a foot out the door ready to go back into practice. But I think by the time I was in my third or fourth year as a professor, I realized that I just love research. I absolutely love asking questions and trying to figure out how to address them. So when, when Bill called, was it, I, I'm trying to recall whether it was um, uh, faculty or was it? Did you come as a research scientist or immediately? Faculty? Yeah. Well, what happened was I um, I worked with Bill uh, first as a postdoc, and then I um, I stuck around for a little while uh, and worked as a research scientist with him, and then I admitted to him how much I absolutely hated working in practice. And I think what I, it wasn't the office. The office was wonderful that I had worked with. I thought they were really great people. I think what I really didn't like was I just didn't like the idea of always being on one side of the equation, always being on the design side. I really wanted to figure out how to move into the, the production side. So becoming a faculty was exciting. I thought it was the thing to do. It was the way to deal with the problem. So, so you came in with this idea of focusing on the production side, that yeah. that was going to be where your career was going to go, yeah. and, and in fact, that's what happened, right? Yeah, that's exactly what happened, and I, and I, you know, and over time, I realized that I, I, I love design. I love designing things, but I, I know that the uh, that architecture will not change until the methods of production change. So, so let's talk about the methods of production changing and where your work has gone since then, because it's really interesting, kind of in some ways, extension of. The modeling work and and you know that you started out doing, but it's sort of ramping it up and yeah, really changing yeah. the way things are actually built. So yeah. just tell, just tell me about how that. Yeah, you know, I had a moment. I think it was early, early on in about two thousand, where uh, well, first I, I just you know there's just this array now of. of people who could produce really nice computer models, renderings, all the stuff I was doing in the 90s. It's just, it's just everywhere now. It's uh, <laughs> sort of like just the pornography of architecture. And, and you see movies everywhere and students who could design these curved shaped buildings and uh, glass and just really absolutely gorgeous stuff. Stuff that I, you know, I knew at, over time would become mainstream but I just had no idea that it would become mainstream as quickly as it has. So by the time that 2000 rolled around, I knew I wanted to move out of that and move more into fabrication and real physical production. And so the big question I always had was, could I take these Palladian models and print them huge? Could I make them the size of real buildings? How do you do that? And then that started to get into, uh, if you want to, make something really big from a computer model. You have to change the way it's structured and change the way that parts are made and the way that parts go together. And it really, for me, got into the idea of a whole new language of architecture and a whole new language of producing a, 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 a structure. And that, that really sort of catapulted into um, looking at uh, this new thing that I'm into now, which is just um, uh, I call it materializing design, but it's really just a, a, a way of manufacturing large objects from computer models. So, is do you find resistance to this idea, this this sort of concept within architecture? And yeah, you know, actually, no. Architects really embrace it because they see it as a way of uh, getting their work built. It's the construction industry that gets a little daunting. Um, and also, I, at this point, I, I don't think the construction industry really knows enough about what I do to feel threatened, but I think over time there is that strong possibility. Because the, the, the fact is, you, you, you can't change the cost of producing a building unless you, ch unless you reduce labor. So it would almost be, you, you have to imagine architecture today or construction, 
uh, sort of like m me taking a photograph of you. Uh, each time I make a photo, take a photograph of you, I'm actually painting it. I'm painting you. Uh, every photograph is different. Every painting is different. And the only way to make the process faster is to get more people to help paint your face faster. Now that, there's no economy of scale there. You know, you're not going to make, reduce the cost of the painting by adding more people or reducing the number of, oh, by, by adding more people or make it faster by adding more people. You need to change the way that you produce the image of you. And that's the way I look at buildings today. So I'm really interested to ask you about this, um, uh, the, the MoMA uh, exhibit and sort of the relationship to rebuilding New Orleans, yeah. Katrina. I yeah. mean, it just seems like, you know, if you go back to the idea of, of the sort of the social ramifications of architecture, we're talking about something right. that's pretty powerful there. Talk, tell me about the, the genesis of that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, that, that's a, uh, yeah, that's another really complicated one. I think, um, and it's complicated because at the time I really wasn't interested in looking at New Orleans. The one thing I really hated at the time was seeing how these, I think there were a number of natural disasters that had happened around the time of New Orleans. I think there was a, a hurricane prior to the Katrina hurricane. And, you know, usually when you see those things, the architects sort of come out of the closet and start producing drawings and um, making proposals and things like that. It, you know, again, it goes back to the whole architect is being, you know, putting on the cape and being Superman and rushing in and saving the environment. But at the end of the day, the architect really only produces drawings. They produce the intent of building. They don't build. So uh, I kind of wanted to stay away from the Katrina thing once it had happened. And I, and I, but I realized over time that that's something that I had to address in my work. I, I knew that I had to do something that uh, related to rebuilding New Orleans in a new, with a new system and a new uh, method of production. So the way that that project, the MoMA project happened, um, it happened in 2008. Uh, at the time I was, I had already built a small cabin as an interlocking set of parts that um, uh, could go together with just, uh, held together with j by just friction and it was only produced by computers and machines run by computers. And I think a student had told the curator about my work. And um, the curator uh, emailed me and said, we have this competition uh, called Home Delivery. And it was all about uh, the production, the new production of buildings, small buildings and homes. And he had asked me to submit a proposal of a small building that could go um, in the museum as a model. And I produced, I think, two or three proposals. One is a small model and one is a small building. And he had asked me to elaborate a little bit more on the small building. So I specifically um, said, well, here's a great opportunity for me to make a small Katrina cottage. Um, and, and, I, and I knew that a lot of the proposals that they were receiving for the show were modern proposals, complex geometry, and uh, um, new systems of production like digital fabrication. So I said, I, this is my chance to really talk about what I was really interested in, using technology to serve ordinary people, not to um, fall into the role of uh, the architect as the artist. I really wanted to look at myself as the architect, as the producer of common um, construction. But produce stuff that was really architecturally, uh, I guess I would say architecturally right with the culture, going back to the idea of mixing culture and uh, design. So I produced this shotgun house as the, as the proposal, and it was accepted. And I think it was accepted because it contrasts the uh, other buildings that were in the exhibit. So the inside of the exhibit had uh, models, um, displays of new wall systems, um, it had an existing uh, house, like a Lustrin house, which was built in the 40s, and it was meant to be, a, uh, at that time, a, a sign of new production for buildings, prefabricated, prefabricated, prefabricated construction. 
And so uh, they also had uh, five buildings that were going to be outside of the museum on an open lot that was between 54th and 55th Street. And the, uh, those sets of proposals were different than the inside, and those were to be full-scale buildings that people could walk through, and they would exhibit uh, in full all of its detail how you would produce a building using a new method, uh, in my case, digital fabrication. So uh, tell me about the production of this, uh, the MoMA exhibit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we, we, we got the commission to do it in 2007, uh, the summer of 2007. And uh, we knew we had to finish it and have a product completed by 2008. Well, I did, so it, wasn't, it was really on, resting on my shoulders. And um, we had to design it. We had to design the exhibit, and then we had to get it approved and we had to fabricate it. And that, the, the entire production, I think, was by far more exciting than the actual show. And the production of it was, first it had to retain the style of, for us, the style of our proposal, which was a New Orleans shotgun house. And then secondly, it had to be built out of plywood, um, a very large structure out of plywood. And I had no idea going into this just how just how overwhelming the process would have been and how overwhelming and difficult uh, it was going to be, the logistics of making it. So we designed it at MIT. We really started the design in about at, at November. It was myself, uh, Dennis Michaud, who was a student, a graduate student, and Dan Smithwick and Laura Rushfeld. The, the four of us really were the sort of the core people. And um, we, uh, and we also, also had a class with a number of students that helped out and did a great job. But the core work was with, uh, was building the structure of the building, making sure to it that people could go inside, that it wouldn't collapse, and that we knew we could put it together on site. So we designed the entire building in CAD, in, in, uh, in, in a CAD system, and um, we had to, make a CAD model that was a, a CAD model of every single component. And it turns out that there were 10,000 components by the time we had started manufacturing. That meant that our hands touched or modeled or drew all 10,000 components. Um, and we had to organize them on sheets of plywood so that they could be cut. So we, we managed to uh, recruit a number of really great people who helped out from the industrial liaison, uh, industrial liaisons uh, program here to uh, some really great sponsors like Shopbot Tools and um, Boise, uh, Boise Cascade, uh, a number of really, really good um, sponsors. Then there was the physical production of all of the parts and components, which was really in the hands of Dan and Dennis. And they just did a masterful job. I, to this day, I actually, I, I still can't believe it actually worked. So then here we are. We arrive in New York City, uh, May. We had 22 days to put together all 10,000 parts uh, before the opening. And uh, we, in, we, we arrived with 10 containers of plywood. And we opened the containers. We started putting parts together, the structure. Um, we had, unfortunately had a few days where we missed being there, and of course the museum called us frantically, like, where are you? <laughs> and, but once we started getting into the rhythm of putting parts together, surprisingly, all of the parts fit. It was a huge jigsaw puzzle of parts about the size of a rug, a small rug. And we were hammering parts together with mallets, clamping them, and believe I, we really, I, to this day, I still can't believe it. The, the, the core structure actually, all but two parts, snapped together. So we're, you're, talk, you're talking almost 5,000 little parts made, and the parts were made in Virginia, made in Virginia on two small CNC machines. Uh, they all fit perfectly. So then we had to put the ornamentation on, and that part got really hard. That really slowed us down. But the ornamentation was everything. The ornamentation is what makes a New Orleans shotgun house. And I remember Dan and myself working on the project all the way up until the night before the opening at 2 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, surprisingly, it, the whole thing worked out. Um, you know, the four of us really did 
a great job. I was never been more proud of doing anything than I had that project. But I will say the design community sort of really didn't, they received it, it was good and bad. I mean, I knew the design community uh, would not understand why I chose to do something like a New Orleans shotgun house. And, uh, you know, if I, when I really look back, I realize a lot of people really enjoyed seeing this sort of puzzle-like building put together. But I, I, there was no way that I could really describe the significance of the shotgun house. But the real core reason why I did it is because it really is the first uh, real piece of architecture that in the United States that was produced by African Americans. Slaves taught each other how to make buildings. Slaves often taught themselves how to make buildings without nails. So this also, too, was a building that was made without nails or screws. And uh, it, was, it was a real unique form. Um, you know, sort of uh, shotgun houses were, had a real, uh, and they still do have a real uh, core underlying technology that allows them to survive. They're meant to take on water. They're meant to get wet, completely soaked and dry. And they were really great devices for cool, cooling spaces. So you needed the porch at the front end. You know, say it's 100 degrees out. The, underneath the porch is about 90, 95. And for a cool breeze to blow through the house, um, by the time it reaches the middle of the house, the temperature was about 85 on the inside. So here you have this natural ventilation system, a way to keep uh, harsh light out a way to cool through air and air movement and it was decorated so that it looked like its own little palace so so to me it was just an amazing invention and i really wanted to figure out how to celebrate and talk about it also it had been three years after um no i'm sorry i think it was two years after the storm and it, the discussion died down all the architects that had made proposals for New Orleans were all gone. And so I kind of felt like that was an opportunity to begin the discussion again. How should we rebuild New Orleans after Katrina? One of the, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this whole process or concept of digital design fabrication is the, you, which you, I, I think you know, you've written about, spoken about a lot, it's, you know, it's, it's potential to have an impact in the lives of um, poor people, people mm -hmm. who are not necessarily uh, patrons of, you know, sort of high architecture or you right. know, reci or beneficiaries of that mm -hmm. kind of with that kind of work. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So, like, like one of the things that are very so going back to New York City and how I really uh, like I lived in an old apartment building, but it it had beautiful moldings, it had uh, really nice grand rooms. Uh, if the rooms were uh, painted or reconstructed, they were really meant to be uh, really nice spaces for middle class families. And with New Orleans, you can almost do the same thing if you use a different method of production. If you were to use carpenter, uh, you, you need to find skilled carpenters who can make uh, or organize moldings, build uh, small cottages at a reasonable price with uh, you know, really nice ornamentation or um, even really grand, great modern design, it's expensive. And if you produce them by machinery, you stand the chance of being able to produce at scale a very nice decorative object that uh, once put together should cost uh, not much more than the cost of the material and material manufacturing. It is the way IKEA works. IKEA offloads all of the assembly onto the customer and the customer does not need expertise in uh, woodworking to put together a piece of IKEA furniture. So you need to figure, I think the industry really needs to figure out a way of taking that type of thinking and moving it into the construction industry. I mean it works for everything. Mansions could be cheaper, <laughs> right? Um, and small buildings could be cheaper. I think. Uh if you go back a few generations in my family, they were farmers in the Midwest, and there, you know, there were the Sears houses that yeah. you could order. And is it sort of like a, a high-tech much, version of that? Oh yes. In fact, actually, Sears got it right. Of all the pre-manufactured pre housing companies, Sears Roebuck figured out how to do the, the had the right business model. They uh, they sold details, 
in the stores. So you could buy a, a freeze, or you could buy a cornice piece, or you could buy uh, columns at the store. And uh, the core building was sold by Sears. And they had over 400 different types of buildings in their catalog. It was, it was an amazing company. Unfortunately, they went out of business because they offered financing. So over time, more people were pay making payments on new houses, and there wasn't enough capital to keep the company going whenever a new house was going to be constructed. They, 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 think they just didn't figure out how to work out a good business scheme. But Sears and Roebuck had it right. Mass customized products, uh, all different types of styles, and they uh, made all of the parts in a factory, and the factory was connected to the railroads. So they, they made them in the factory, put all the parts in the railroads, and they uh, shipped parts to the towns, and then trucks took them to the site. It was a great business model. So since the, the MoMA exhibit where you got to sort of put this into practice on a, you know, a, a, a full-size building, where, where's your work been going since then? What, what since do you, then, what yeah. Do you, what do you well, take? since then, I've, I've had to take a little step back from it uh, myself and the three students, three of the students that I work with. We, re we tried to turn it into a business model, but we realized that it was just way ahead of its time, meaning uh, ahead of its time in the, along the lines of the culture of the industry. The industry, I don't think, is ready for the shock of going from hand labor to machine labor in one year, I, I, I think most people, uh, I think most people, one can't figure out how that would probably work. And I knew that I needed more time to figure out how to explain it to people and come up with examples of how it could work. So over the last two years, I've been focusing more on um, uh, writing about it and focusing a little bit more and coming up with some new ways of producing buildings. So my, my next real work is going to be um, first a book to explain how this all works. Uh, that should be coming out in the summertime. And then the only way that I could really see making this work is to produce it myself, um, finding um, people to partner with and produce small buildings. There, there really is a need for very, very small um, manufactured buildings uh, at the price of a trailer. So um, if you think about the FEMA home, the replacement, the, what they use to replace homes in New Orleans, they use FEMA trailers because they were the right, they're the right price. They're about $50,000. And they have really good technology. They're just symbolically the wrong choice. But now I think that with the work that I'm doing, I think there is a way to produce at the same price as a trailer uh, a really high-tech, uh, beautiful building. And it could be any style, modernist, arts and crafts, uh, a shotgun house. And so what about the, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to channel uh, construction people. Uh, you know, the sort of the whole yeah. idea of, uh, you know, customization and, and you know, that kind of right. issue with, I mean, when you're talking about, you know, a customer, do you, that's just something that you basically are shifting, right, to sort of earlier in the process where they're... Yeah, yeah, you know, well, they can customize and make their own products. Yeah. I mean, the reality is most people uh, who buy a home, if... Uh, well, there are two parts. They're, they're sort of the, the small houses are really meant for developers. Uh, developers usually buy things in mass and they do want variety, uh, but they tend to look more towards um, consumption of large products. I mean, excuse me, a lot of products, a lot of buildings. If you're talking about someone who wants a customized home, a custom home on a custom site, those tend to be slightly higher end clients people who buy houses that are in the half a million to million dollar range. And for something like that, I don't think that my technology will get to those types of people right away. Although it's interesting because it's slowly starting to come around. When I look at construction around Massachusetts, I've noticed that they're moving away from dimensional lumber, which are two by fours and two by eights, and they're replacing all of that stuff with plywood. They're making a lot of buildings now that would typically be out of dimensional lumber wood, ex almost exclusively out of plywood. And the the sort of digital um, fabrication process, 
is that again sort of relying on 3D printing or I mean plywood? Mm. What's what you know? What, talk about the it's, materials. It's, that yeah, so would. the materials can be plastic, wood, obviously uh, plastic, plywood, uh, metal. Uh, you can imagine um, a house that's framed out of metal, plastic, and wooden parts instead of exclusively wood. So uh, most buildings are not under the same amount of pressure consistently. It would be better if places where the loads are light, you use really inexpensive materials. Where the loads are heaviest, you use really expensive material, but you use a small amount of it. And you can control all of that in the design. So you can control cost a lot better. But the way it really would work is uh, you would almost imagine the concept of, uh, I, like I was going back to IKEA, IKEA furniture at a mass scale where buildings arrived as in boxes uh, with all of the parts and components included. Right. And the, and the parts themselves are basically, the, the creation of the parts is controlled by a computer. Right? Yeah, that's right. That's, that's crucial, right. Yeah. Crucial thing, right. Yeah. And if you look at now, it's funny because now you have uh, art stores. Like if you go to an art store, uh, they, they have a, a lot of art stores have these large tables where they can cut a custom mat for a picture frame for you. And you can imagine someday people who uh, manufacture linoleum, carpet, uh, sheetrock, ceilings, anything, use the same machines. They use machines that are controlled by computers to pre-cut all of the parts, pre-cut carpet, and it's installed in a very simple and easy way. Yeah, once you say it, it sort of seems obvious, doesn't it? Anyway. It does seem quite obvious, yeah. but it's not. <laughs> like, why wouldn't you pre-cut all of the tiles for a bathroom? But you can't because the structure is made by hand, so you have to go back and remeasure all of the handwork by the previous contractor. Now, for a building that's put together by a real master carpenter, real beautiful woodwork, that's great. But most people can't afford that. Only a handful of people can really afford a master carpenter. Right. Um, just to shift gears, I wanted to ask you about uh, teaching, mentoring. I mean, now that you are a oh, faculty yeah. member, I mean, you sort of uh, you've talked about Bill Mitchell and Ike Colbert and people who yeah. really were, you know, made a major difference in in your life and in your career trajectory, you know, you're sort of, the shoe's on the other foot now, I guess. In yeah, in many ways it is. But, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I think that real teaching and mentoring is one-on-one. -on -one. You really need to find that right person that's ready to be mentored and ready to, ready for you at that time. And I think one of the things that I've had to learn over time is every student is not ready to be mentored the way that I would like to mentor them. And trying to meet them where they are at the right time with the right emotion is difficult and it's a it's a challenge but that's part of what makes it great you know if you can really click with a student and some students are ready to be mentored some students may only want a small amount of advice from you that's that's the best part of being a teacher or a professor is finding that right moment with that right student it's probably hard to generalize, but do you think that students uh, have changed over the years? Uh, in you know, in, in, you know, either in, in terms of their interests or their sort of their expectations or what they think they're going to go on and do. Yeah, at the core, no. Students are still the same. I think that at the core, students come here. They're they're absolutely brilliant. They're they're ready to take on challenges. They can't get enough of the place, and by the time that they're ready to graduate and leave, they're ready to stay. Uh, culturally, uh, the institute has changed a lot. You see a larger population of Asian students. Um, MIT has had a greater interest in Asia over the last 10 years, and, and, and Africa and the rest of the world, much more so than when I was a student. And I also find that the, um, the challenges for faculty are much greater to uh, try to uh, be sympathetic uh, to students who don't come in to MIT with the same interest and understanding of the world that the professor does. 
So for example, a lot of students who do come in from Asia, they have a different take on um, how architecture is produced, how architecture is discussed. And it's hard for some students uh, coming from abroad and mixing in with the culture. And I think that it's really a big challenge for a professor to learn from the student as they teach the student. Because for us, it's an incredible learning experience. So I do think things have changed, at least in terms of where the students have come from have changed, and your approach to teaching have changed. But the amazing curiosity and absolute brilliance of the students is still the same. I warned you that I was going to ask you about bike riding before the end. <laughs> uh, maybe, I'll, yeah. maybe I'll do that. So, no, so is, I, that, I mean, this is something that, you know, just, just I think is totally interesting when you sort of find out that <laughs> people have these other lives, these, yeah. other, these other things they've done. So Yeah, well, bike racing, is, bike racing and architecture have sort of been my entire life from the time. Same thing from the time I was 12. Until now, I still love riding my racing bike to Walden Pond and um, coming back on a nice warm uh, summer day. Yeah, I can even do it even in the cold. Uh, I thought 35 degrees is my breaking point. But I love bike riding and I love bike racing, the, the sport of bike racing. And I raced for 10 years before I came to MIT. And I learned a tremendous amount from racing. I more learned a lot about myself and uh, my shortcomings and what I can do and what I can't do. Um, I, I started off bike racing when I was 18. I mostly riding around Central Park, and I really started riding, trying to learn about Manhattan and seeing buildings and things like that. And over time, I took it a little bit more seriously. That I was never as good as some of the people that I raced against, um, the people that were re really good friends with. I could see that they were really serious, and I always had a foot in architecture. And I, and I managed, I was really proud of the fact that I managed to work my way up to doing the Olympic trials in 1992, um, right before I came to MIT. But the big disappointment for me was the Olympic trials. I, I really just wanted to go to the final, and uh, they, I think I got, I got seventh in the heat, and they took six to the final. So for me, I just, I'd never forgotten that moment of just incredible disappointment, and um, I could have gone to the final if I, I think if I had a little bit more confidence in myself at the time. So by the time I arrived at MIT, I, you know, I said, that's it, I know I'm not gonna be racing anymore, and I put, all of that same competitive energy into being here as a student. And I, I think uh, I still have that same competitive spirit. I just definitely don't have the <laughs> physique to ride like I used to. But I do miss cycling, I miss racing at times, but I, I, uh, I still really enjoy the sport. And I love, when the Tour de France is on in June, um, June, excuse me, July, uh, that's it, the television is mine and <laughs> I watch the Tour de France from start to finish. So I'm, I'm just like that image of you riding around Manhattan is sort of yeah. like learning to love buildings and biking at the same time is a yeah. great one. Yeah. yeah, it was. And I would say my wife, that was kind of a shock to her too. Like there are only really two things, well there are three things that turn my head, but the two major things that turn my head are buildings and bikes and you know I really, uh, I, I really loved you know seeing a new building go up or you know, seeing a group of bike riders, you know, my wife always calls them, oh, those are your kind. <laughs> so um, thinking about back to, you know, MIT and, you, you know, you mentioned sort of the cultural changes at the Institute. Looking ahead, I mean, how do you see MIT, this is kind of a very big general question, yeah. but how do you see MIT continuing to be part of the, the conversation in terms of, you know, I mean, just there's a lot of angst in the world about about um, inequality and social change and, yeah. and, you know, the place of science and technology. And, you know, where where do we take that one at, at MIT? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea, but I think that's why I love being here. Uh, that's a really tough question to ask because I think that now the Institute is starting to look outside of itself. It no longer can find, you know, I don't think that the days of uh, turning to the government, like NSF and things like that, for exclusively for funding, or looking at corporations as an exclusive funding source are sort of evaporating. 
I think MIT has to be creative in finding funding. It has to be creative in talking about science and talking about um, technology and engineering. Uh, it really has to find a way of connecting with uh, the world better outside of the United States. And I think more importantly, it has to find a way of um, doing this without being this all, um, this, this exclusive place. I think that the best ideas are outside of here now. And we have to find a way of connecting with people outside of the United States and outside of MIT to find um, those ideas and bring them back to some of the people who are here. Uh, I really have no idea of what's going to happen with MIT over time. I, I know it'll always be a great place. I just, I think that's what makes it exciting, is that it's an emerging, emerging place. Great. Um, as you were thinking about coming in this afternoon to talk, were there things that you thought that you wanted to talk to about talk that we haven't brought up, brought up, or? No, you know, I think you, you covered know, it all. <laughs> <the stories. laughs> yeah, I think you covered it all, but I definitely will say, is, well, going, back to, going back to Bill Mitchell, I think that that's probably the one thing I can never talk enough about is Bill and his influence in the, in, uh, his influence on the field, his influence in architecture and his influence in design. I, I just, uh, boy, he really made a huge mark here. And I uh, definitely say that for me, he, he definitely uh, really made my time here. And so did Ike Cole, but I really have to say the two of them really made my time here. And I'm really forever grateful. Well, thanks so much for coming in to talk to us today. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. It was really great doing this. Thank you. Appreciate it.